An American general once said that war is hell, and probably no war depicts that better than World War I. Again, this was not called World War I in the beginning. It was simply referred to as the Great War. Why that phrase we're, we're going to discuss. What we're going to do is take a, a rather quick and cursory view at the, at the war itself, the causes of the war, how it started, what the uh, technological advances were that, that made this the Great War, and then we'll uh, slide into how the United States got involved in that war, and more importantly, how she and their president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, attempted to end that war. So first, let's take a look at the war as a summary. Look at Europe in the uh, early 1900s. What we're going to see is the rise of a bunch of isms, ISMS. These isms um, were at the heart of what was going to wind up becoming, as Barbara Tuckman said in her famous book, The Guns of August, at the heart of what was going to plunge Europe and then the entire world into a war. Again, it's referred to as the Great War. It doesn't become World War I, obviously, until World War II starts. Now, as you take a look at the map, you'll notice that many of the countries that we're familiar with today didn't even exist. You don't see a Czech Republic or a Slovak Republic. You don't see um, Bosnia. You don't see... Um, some of the other countries that are that are referred to as the Balkans in there. And Russia, of course, was a huge empire uh, taking in areas that we now know as the Ukraine, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Latvia, uh, and so forth. Finland at that time, as you see in the map, was part of Russia. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire was a huge conglomerate of various and sundry nationalities. Some of these countries, as you look in the map, for example, Germany and Italy are relatively brand new. They really didn't become nations as we define that until uh, the mid 19th century. So all of these were about to bring about some changes that are going to push Europe closer and closer to the brink of war. The first ism we're talking about is what we were just really hinting at, and that is nationalism. Extreme pride in your country, and of course, it involves ethnic identification, identification through language, culture, religion, etc. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire was a... Um, a rather creaky old empire that was being torn asunder by various nationalistic tendencies of the minorities that existed within their empire. Uh, Austria and Hungary, of course, today are two separate countries. Back then, they were ruled by one ruling family, and that was the Hohenzollerns. France had lost part of what she considered to be her heritage, the province of Alsace-Lorraine to Germany in what was then called the Franco-Prussian War in the 1870s. And Alsace-Lorraine is going to bounce back and forth like a ball at the French Open. And that's a tennis reference in case you weren't clear with that. Uh, and would constantly be a source of contention between those two countries. Germany uh, had coalesced under the Prussian Otto von Bismarck. And Bismarck, the Iron Duke, as he was sometimes referred to, 
uh, was the one that, that pushed Prussia to the forefront of German unification and using military means to secure the goals that she had set for herself. Russia was again another uh, teetering empire that was on the brink of disaster. A group of people known as the Bolsheviks, led by various and sundry people, the most important, I should say the most famous, was Vladimir Lenin, who at this time uh, was in exile in Switzerland. But the Germans were going to make sure that he got back to Russia. And of course, the Bolsheviks were communists, or some would say socialists, at heart. Was militarism. Remember, Alfred Thayer Mahan's book, which had become the Bible for many of the great countries or the great wannabes uh, throughout the world, said that in order to be a great power, one needed a great navy. So control of the seas was going to lead to an arms race. And that arms race was um, highlighted by the development of giant battleships. The first one was called the Dreadnought. And thereafter, they were all classified as dreadnoughts. England started it, and Germany was going to jump. The next is in colonialism. Again, overseas competition. Who was going to be able to divide up Africa and Asia? Remember the United States getting involved in the Boxer Rebellion in China. Uh, when all the great nations were trying to carve spheres of influence in China. This was uh, going to be the same thing in Africa. It was going to be the same thing in the rest of Asia and in the Pacific, with a lot of nations heretofore not mentioned as great nations, Japan, of course, being one of them. Germany is a newcomer to this game. So this competition for land, for uh, the natural resources that were in that land and for markets is going to increase the tension between the various powers as they play the game. The next cause of the war. Of course, you know, this means war. And it would. Treaties between various countries, which other countries were unaware of, meant that when you were assessing the strength of a possible opponent, you were not really sure about that strength. Keep in mind uh, the intermarriage between uh, the great royal houses was commonplace back then. Uh, you had Britain ruled by a German, ruled by uh, a Frenchman who was married to a Russian who, I mean, and, and the list just goes on and on. And oftentimes, these led to these secret treaties, which were fueled many times by the wants and desires of industrialists who saw the way this is a way of increasing their finances and, of course, their profits. What that touches this whole war off will be lit by a group, a domestic terror group called the Black Hand. And it occurs in the town of Sarajevo in Bosnia. Bosnia today, of course, is a separate independent country, but at the time it was part of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Serbia had a desire for Bosnia, because it was inhabited by mostly Serbs, uh, to become part of its nation. So the Black Hand were Serbian separatists in Bosnia who would assassinate the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Little side note, uh, the Archduke would be assassinated while on a motorcade through Sarajevo. The driver of that car would be my professor for World War I in college at St. Joseph's College at the time, now St. Joseph's University. And uh, he gets very emotional when he would talk about that. Oftentimes when we wanted to uh, get out of class, no matter what we were talking about, one of us would raise our hands and ask him to 
please explain the assassination again. He would get all teared up. He had lost his arm uh, in the assassination attempt. And uh, he would then go off on a tangent. We would put our notebooks and pencils away, realizing that class essentially was over. Don't even try it with me. So you had various alliances. We will only concentrate on two alliances, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Turkey, known as the Central Powers. Britain, France, and Russia would be the Triple Entente. Later, uh, they would be joined by Italy. So the Triple Entente, the Central Powers, again, all vying for power. When the war starts, as a result of this uh, assassination of the Archduke, Austria-Hungary, encouraged by Germany, was really looking just for an excuse to put down Serbia and put an end to its meddling in the affairs of the empire. But of course, Serbia was aligned with Russia, who had an alliance with France, who had an alliance with Great Britain. But what Austria-Hungary and Germany were banking on <clears throat> was that uh, it would take Russia, who was so large and backward, it would take them so long to put their army together that they would be able to crush Serbia in the meantime. What nobody was counting on was this being the time. was a war that, unlike all of Europe's past wars, which consisted of the movement of large armies, perhaps one great battle and then it was over, this was a war that was going to be dictated by the new technology that was going to be involved. You see some of the technology on the screen, starting in the uh, bottom right-hand corner. You see a battleship being sunk by an unseen enemy, and that, of course, being the introduction of the submarine. Going to the left of that, the machine gun, which could fire at the time, which considered uh, a tremendous amount, up to 200 rounds per minute. Now, of course, it's in the thousands. Uh, above that, the airplane, which in the beginning of the war was simply used as a spotter. After that, by the end of the war, thousands of them would blacken the skies, and of course, dropping bombs, sometimes handheld, uh, strafing troops. So it brought a completely different facet to the war. To the right of the airplane, you will see the, the tank being introduced in around 1915, 1916. And then at the very top, you see what the war would eventually devolve into. And that would be trench warfare and land that looked like moonscapes, oftentimes called no man's land. And of course, <laughs> gas warfare. Ah, yes, okay. The introduction of, introduction of poison gas, mustard gas, chlorine gas, killing thousands, but more often blinding them and uh, causing their lungs to burn and thus making them uh, incapable of carrying on combat. This is a diagram, if you will, of what, how sophisticated the trench warfare became. And it would be typical if you start uh, at the top on the left, where of course no man's land, you see the, the trenches with communication trenches between the backup trenches, uh, a whistle would blow, everybody would jump over the top, run across no man's land, get machine gunned to death or gassed or hit with artillery shells, uh, then there would be a counterattack. They would push you out of your frontline trench, back to the support trench, whistle a blow from the support trench, and this would just continue back and forth. Most of no man's land uh, was pretty much in, confined to Belgium and France. When the war started, uh, 
Germany did an unthinkable thing. They broke the rules and they invaded through neutral Belgium. And that is what brings Great Britain into the war. And so the war would take place throughout those areas. And within a few months, there would be a line of trenches stretching from the North Sea all the way down to the Adriatic, over 500 miles in length, parallel to one another with no man's land in between. There you see the trenches. In those four years, uh, trenches would change hands. The uh, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people would die in just trying to conquer a few hundred yards of land. Then in 1917, a turning point. That man, that in real life, would be missed on a train provided by the Germans. That was the fire of the Russian. Now, no, no, this revolution. What that, what that effectively did was it removed Russia from the war. And now what the Germans could do was to start one front warfare. They could take their troops in the millions from the Eastern front, move them to the Western front. And what they hoped to do was to start an offensive, which would, uh, end the war before what they had predicted would take place, the United States enters World War I. I don't think I recorded. 